Have you ever seen something or heard something that just didn't add up? Like you weren't getting the whole story. Modern science delivers amazing knowledge about the natural world, but some of the things we've come to accept as true are actually disputed by a number of scientists from around the globe. Depending upon each person's paradigm, people can look at the exact same thing and walk away with entirely different pictures. Let's roll! My name is Cutter Calloway. I've been fascinated by the great questions of life for as long as I can recall. Where do we come from? Why is there something rather than nothing? I know I'm not alone here, so I want to take you on a journey through the elegant, beautiful, sophisticated creation we call home. This is The Paradigm Project. episode, we find ourselves in Newport Beach at a gathering of some of the world's most dangerous minds, a group of PhDs that dare to question neo-Darwinian thinking. For those of you who aren't familiar with Charles Darwin's theory that all of life evolved from random, undirected processes, hang tight and we'll unpack it for you shortly. From time to time, we'll be using a number of film techniques that are often used to play tricks on the viewer's eyes. But don't worry, when it comes to science and scripture, there won't be any illusions, optical or otherwise. Let's go meet our first expert. Speaking of which, I should probably make myself look a little more presentable. That's better. These rebellious, free-thinking scientists are part of a growing global movement called Intelligent Design. They're hosting a special event here in Southern California to celebrate the first meeting many of them had in secret 25 years ago to discuss all of their heretical ideas. Cutter. Hey there. It's nice to meet you at Cutter last. Calloway. Yeah, that's great. As well. Dr. Stephen Meyer is one of the chief architects of the modern intelligent design movement. He's a former geophysicist and college professor and author of the New York Times bestseller, Darwin's Doubt. So maybe give me the ground level uh, layperson. I've never heard of intelligent design before. What's, what's the first thing that we need to know coming out the door? Yeah, well, intelligent design is the idea that there are certain features of the universe and life that are best explained by a designing intelligence rather than an undirected, or unguided process like natural selection. The movement has gone worldwide and the research effort has become much more mainstream as, as scientists within mainstream universities and research centers are approaching questions of biology and chemistry and biochemistry and biological origins from the standpoint of an intelligent design perspective. Whether we're looking at the very foundation of the universe and the fine tuning of the laws and constants of physics, or whether we're looking at our planetary system, the way in which our solar system is fine tuned to allow for life, but that it seems to be fine tuned to allow for us to make scientific discoveries about the solar system and beyond. And then when you get to the living realm, you have body plans and anatomical structures. Then when you go inside the cells, you find these little tiny nano machines and this exquisite digital information stored in the DNA molecule. And every layer of the cell is revealing new and extraordinary complexity that we had no idea about even 30, 40 years ago. With the discovery of DNA and the genetic information it carries, an entirely new layer of reality was revealed, forcing scientists to rethink the current paradigms. In recent decades, science has revealed an amazing microscopic universe residing in each of us. Since DNA is literally at the core of the matter, let's go back a few years and take a closer look. In 1859, Charles Darwin published a book claiming that all the different types of creatures on Earth came from a common ancestor a really long time ago. During his travels, he noticed some animals had slight variations that helped them survive better than others of their kind. 
He proposed that these traits were passed on to the offspring, and eventually, given enough time, entirely new species would be created. This became known as natural selection, or survival of the fittest. Back in the olden days, before these fancy supercomputers and electronic measuring devices and all these great scientific methods, the human cell was commonly thought to be a piece of jelly or protoplasm. Biologist Thomas Huxley even reported seeing living protoplasm in mud from the ocean floor, and it was commonly thought that life was spontaneously created in nature. Mice could appear from piles of rags, frogs from mud, and flies could spontaneously generate on dead bodies. However, in 1862, French scientist Louis Pasteur disproved the theory of spontaneous generation and received an award for his work. Side note, Pasteur's legacy still lives on today. We continue to use his method of pasteurization to collect dairy and poop. So if life wasn't created spontaneously, how did the original ancestor get here in the first place? In the early 1950s, Stanley Miller and Harold Urey went searching for the answer. They conducted an experiment to simulate lightning hitting a mixture of gases meant to represent the early Earth's atmosphere. The result was the formation of several amino acids, the chemical building blocks of proteins. Miller and Urey thought they had recreated the first step in the origin of life. Later, however, geochemists concluded the mixture of gases used was not realistic. When the experiment was rerun with a realistic mixture of gases, it failed. Before the complex inner workings of the cell had been discovered, you can see why people thought all you had to do was shoot some lightning into some gas and voila, it's alive! <laughs> it's one thing to hear it from a mad scientist, but biology textbooks continue to promote the Miller-Urey experiment today. Another problem with the origin of life is explaining how amino acids could form a living creature in the first place. Ever seen your tub of whey protein pop out an amoeba? In 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick shocked the world with their discovery of the double helix structure of DNA, and Crick announced that they had found the secret of life. The structure could explain how DNA replicates and also how it carries information needed by the cell. But this still doesn't explain the origin of the information. DNA is extremely complex, and all organisms on the planet have it. So where did it come from in the first place? Fast forward to 2011. The ENCODE project succeeded in identifying many functional elements in the human genome. Turns out we have over 3 billion pairs of subunits in each DNA molecule, which contain information necessary to build our bodies. For such an immense amount of information to randomly appear on its own would be like letters appearing out of nothing and forming around a million pages of highly organized information. Could all of this have really been produced by unguided natural processes? Digital information directing the construction of mechanical systems. That's what's going on inside life. And that raises a really huge question, which is, where did the information come from? And I call this the information enigma. And this is where intelligent design comes in, because what we know from our experience, from our uniform and repeated experience, whether we're looking at a hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book, information embedded in a radio signal, Whenever we see information, especially in a digital or alphabetic form, and we trace it back to its source, we always come to a mind, not a material process. And we're arguing that in the case of the origin of life, there was a master programmer responsible for the information that makes life possible. Bill Gates, the man who helped revolutionize the world by creating Microsoft, said, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. We have tons of experience writing digital code and using digital information. One thing we know mathematically is if you have random changes to the zeros and ones in functional software, you will degrade and eventually destroy the functionality of it long before you would end up with a new functional system. Studies in biology show this same analysis applies to DNA code as well. So it takes intelligence to create information. If we saw a drawing of DNA in the sand, would we ever think it occurred from random mindless causes like erosion and wind? Look at how difficult it's been for tech companies to try and create life in the lab. 
From AI to robots to other experiments, it's so complex that even with countless billions of dollars invested, we still don't fully know how the human mind works and can't even create the amino acids needed for life using purely naturalistic processes. I think it's really important right now to critique Darwinism on its own terms, on scientific terms. The theory is in a state of crisis. It has been for a while. It does a great job of explaining small-scale modifications, like finch beaks that get a little bigger, a little smaller in response to changing weather patterns in the Galapagos. But it does a really bad job of explaining the origin of birds and animals in the first place. Natural selection explains the survival, but not the arrival of the fittest. Mutation and selection can't even explain the origin of a single protein. The general consensus in the field, even people like Richard Dawkins, who's a great proponent of Darwinian materialism, has acknowledged publicly that no one knows how the first life arose via an evolutionary process or a materialistic process. Darwin's theory has evolved over the years into the modern Neo-Darwinian theory, which assumes the first creature was probably a single-celled organism that formed itself, probably in the ocean. Somehow, this creature would have sustained itself long enough to eventually reproduce. As generations of offspring were created, beneficial mutations in their DNA would eventually create more complex features such as arms, brains, wings, and eyes, and eventually all the species we have today. Darwinian thinking is used to explain everything from why we make the decisions we do, like which foods and mates we prefer, to why humans have a tendency to believe in God. But there are serious problems at the foundational level of the theory. Despite the confident hype in biology textbooks and news reports, doubts about Darwinian evolution are growing among scientists. Darwinian ideas are so entrenched in our culture that it will take time for things to change. But that change has begun to happen. What are the implications for this conversation for everyday people in the pews or everyday person just living their life as a Christian in the world? Why should they care about this conversation? We have a, an epidemic in this culture of, first of all, suicide. We're at all-time high rates, especially suicide among young people. We have an opioid epidemic. I think a lot of what drives the angst in the culture is a sense that there isn't or can't be an ultimate meaning to life. And that is, I think, actually a very rational response to the prevailing philosophy of our elite culture, our knowledge culture, coming out of the universities, the law schools, the courts, the idea that matter and motion are all that ultimately exists, that at the end of the day, there will be a heat death of the universe, and that when we die, we rot. Then the worry that there is no ultimate meaning to life, I think, is actually one that makes a lot of sense. And it's something that haunted me as a teenager. And so I, I think the rediscovery of evidence that's pointing to the reality of a personal intelligence behind life, behind the universe, raises the possibility of a more hopeful answer uh, to the, the quest for meaning. I'm really beginning to see the gravity of this discussion and its importance on the world. It's amazing to hear so much evidence of design and the building blocks of life. DNA is especially intriguing as it truly seems to defy neo-Darwinian thinking. Well, it's time to meet our next world-renowned expert, Jonathan Wells. Dr. Wells has two PhDs, is a medical laboratory supervisor, taught biology at California State University, and has published many books, including the infamous Icons of Evolution, which discusses the use of outdated and incorrect evidence of evolution in school textbooks. Hey, Dr. Wells, I presume. Cutter. Cutter nice Calloway, to, yeah. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you as well. Yeah, heard a lot about you. Uh, thanks, me, me as well. Uh, you want to come back and have a conversation with us? Uh, let's do it. Great, all right. I hear uh, you were a lifeguard? Yeah, not a beach lifeguard. Oh, okay. I was a lifeguard for many years. I taught lifeguards. We found ourselves a nice little place here on the beachfront. Good. You know. The Paradigm Project, Jonathan Wells, thank one. It'd be interesting to hear you talk about what's the most exciting evidence you're seeing that points in the direction of, of God. Well, I'm an embryologist by training. I always thought that in embryology, we saw the most evidence for design. Then I met a bunch of colleagues from other disciplines, and they all thought that in their discipline, there was the most evidence. The evidence is all around us, I think. 
When I finished my undergraduate work, which was in uh, the sciences, I was basically an atheist. I, I just assumed that Darwinism was true. The more I learn as a scientist, the more design I see. We know now, which Darwin didn't know, that cells are incredibly complex assemblies of molecular machines that move cargo along microtubules inside the cell, like trucks on a highway, and they're very specific about where they're going. Other molecular machines uh, unwind the DNA so it can be transcribed into protein, RNA and protein. When you look at these details, which we can now do with modern technology, the appearance of design is just overwhelming. I mean, these things don't happen by chance. I first saw design in nature, and then I read the Bible. I actually read it from cover to cover, like a novel. I see it, among other things, as a history of God's relationship with us. Design, for me, is based, however, on evidence, not on the Bible. In the classic tradition, of course, they are both revelations from God, the natural revelation and the scriptural revelation and they combine to give us a fuller understanding. They don't contradict each other, and that's how I see it now. It reminds me a bit of uh, Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, and then later in the same Psalm, the law of the Lord is perfect and right. So it's, it's both, here's this natural wonder proclaiming God, and then also God's law given to us. One without the other is hard to really make coherent, I think, but they're, they're sort of partners. Since I saw design and changed my thinking, I have never doubted it. Just so we're on the same page, let's discuss a few definitions. The word adaptation, of course, precedes Darwin, and it just means the ability of an organism to change to fit its environment. What it tells me as a biologist is that organisms are incredibly well designed so that they have the ability to adapt to their environment, within limits, of course. Another side of the coin is the idea of mutation, mistakes in DNA copying. They do cause some disease. One thing we know for sure from the evidence is that mutations do not lead to new species, new organs, or new body plants. That is what Darwin's theory requires. Our understanding of the world is framed by a very particular set of pictures. For most 21st century people, the Darwinian picture is the default way of framing things. But what if we used a different frame? Would we see anything new? Evolutionary thinking, that is Darwinian thinking, gave us the notion of junk DNA. We know that only 2% of our DNA encodes proteins. And for a long time, many biologists thought the other 98% was junk because they thought that evolution was accidental and the junk just accumulated. But anyone coming from a design perspective would have thought, well, maybe there's function there. It turns out that there is in much of that. And the more we look, the more function we find. So Darwinian thinking actually uh, was a science stopper for a long time. Design thinking would have freed it up and encouraged research into this so-called junk DNA. This is some pretty mind-blowing stuff. So why aren't we hearing this side of the story on our favorite nature show? We're hoping our next expert can shed some light on this question for us. Dr. Doug Axe is already back at work, so let's hit the road. Are you Dr. Axe? I am. Cutter Calloway. Cutter, good to hey, meet you. Great to meet you as well. Uh, is this your building? This is the science building. I don't Great. own it, but I have a spot <laughs> in it. I can show you around. Doug is a molecular biologist and the director of Biologic Institute. His experiments examining the constraints on the evolution of protein systems included inserting large libraries of mutated DNA into the cell. He surprised both himself and his colleagues with the discovery of just how fragile DNA really is. His work has been featured in many scientific journals. Dr. Axe which, by the way, is an awesome name. <laughs> I kind of like it, yeah. Thank you for sitting down and chatting with us. A few questions, really, about your research and uh, the, the things you're finding in your specific domain of the sciences. I uh, was in a molecular genetics uh, course at, at Caltech in, on the way to, to doing a PhD there, and was learning about the control systems that are activated at the subcellular level, at the molecular level, how genes get upregulated and downregulated, and just found the mechanism to be absolutely brilliant. And that's when a light bulb went on for me and I thought, hey, this is engineering at the molecular level. And I also thought the story of how these things come about 
through a natural process like random mutation and natural selection, I found that very unconvincing. I thought it'd be very interesting to go into the lab and do the work that would show whether that can work or not. Really interesting. So you came from an engineering background, yeah. asking the question of how might an engineer design this, is yes. what you're asking. And do you, as an engineer, would you have had the capacity to design what you found biologically in life? Uh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> you can get all the engineers together. Um, life is remarkable. Proteins are these long chain molecules that get made from genes. So one gene carries the genetic instructions for stitching together amino acids that fold into a protein. And the proteins fold into complex three-dimensional structures that do the actual molecular work of life. Chemistry, they make molecular motors, they make uh, scaffolds for the cell. So every cell has thousands of these different kinds of proteins doing different jobs within the cell. As a believer who bases his life on the truths of Scripture, everything that I do is touched by my understanding of what's true, and Scripture is the big thing that informs me about what's true. I'm also being informed by simply looking at the world around me. If God did create the universe, then when you're studying things, you're studying the handiwork of God. Likewise, you can go to Scripture and study what we call special revelation. It's the stuff that required words to convey, not just you know the big physical picture that we live within. So these are two things that I think are both equally of God, and I'm, I'm fascinated by and interested in the study of both. What I want to do when I go into lab is simply go and do science extremely well and humbly. Because if we approach science humbly, just as if we approach scripture humbly, we'll acknowledge there are passages where I don't know what it means. Scientists should be able to say the same thing. Here's the data. I could give you my interpretation, but it's my opinion being added to the data. I don't know what some of this means. So really you're advocating for humility with all the parties involved right. in that sense. That's maybe part of why there's so much tension at this dialogue between the two sides. If both sides could say, um, some things are very clear and let me show you and you'll agree with me because they're so clear and some things are not so clear. How do you balance pushing science that challenges mainstream ideas without the sort of lay audience going like, ah, we can't trust any of it. They None of them agree, none of them know what's going on, and they just become more entrenched in their skepticism. What, what does that look like to balance those two sides? Well, it's a very complicated thing, as you know, if you're looking into this. I think if we back up and go to, you know, shortly after World War II came to a close. There was an era there in the 50s and the 60s, the moon landing. That's one small step for man. Where it seemed as though science couldn't do anything wrong. It was paving the way to our future. And at the same time, we have growing in our culture an extreme skepticism toward politicians, toward lawyers, toward big business. And I think there's a healthy degree to which we should be skeptical. For a long time, it seemed as though the scientific community was exempt from that. If you have a white lab coat on, then everyone's supposed to say, well, you're the scientist, you're the expert, you know. The reality is the people doing science are 100% human. They're as human as the people doing business or politics. They do have their selfish interests. There's fame and fortune to be had in the sciences. And in that mix, the truth gets maligned occasionally. But a big message is you don't have to be an expert to enter into this. You don't have to have a PhD to be confident that your intuition that we're here because we're intended to be here is correct. You can do that from common sense. Our view of the world is increasingly being influenced by big data and algorithms. We may think we're encountering reality when we look on our favorite social media, but the truth is our pictures of the world are being manipulated and dictated to us by multinational corporations and other moneyed interests. These corporate giants reap massive profits by steering us toward certain products, thoughts, experiences, and even political candidates. And if that's the case, with all that information that's out there, how do we know what to trust, much less whom to trust? When you read online that scientists say, how do you know if it's all scientists, 100 scientists, or no scientists at all? Well, for starters, we need to do a better job of following the information back to the source for ourselves. But beyond that, in this information age, we need to develop wisdom and discernment. 
In this age of information, you can't always trust everything you see. One of the greatest challenges we face as people of faith in the modern world is that we're losing our ability to see through the lens of the other. It's almost like we've lost this critical capacity to empathize with, much less love our neighbor as ourselves, especially neighbors who see the world differently than we do. And the time has come for a radical rethinking of this paradigm. Oh, oh. <laughs> Fancy measuring devices, www.googles. With the tweeting on the Twitters, that's when the human cell was commonly thought to be made of jelly, my favorite thing. In this age of information, you can't always trust everything you see. Cut! You are in my eyeline. Wait, none of this is actually recording yet, is it? <laughs> We've got so much more in store for you all, so stay tuned for the next episode where we'll explore the latest scientific discoveries about human consciousness, navigation systems in birds, and even the best recipe for fish tacos. In the meantime, keep that mind open.